Policy Basics. In this nugget, we'll be addressing policy basics, where we'll take a look at local policy. There's also domain-based policy, which exists in Active Directory, but we'll start off by talking about local policy, which only exists on individual computers and cannot be shared between computers. Then we'll also take a look here, I guess I forgot to cross my T there, <laughs> at the uh, scope of management. Once, especially once you get into the domain level and Active Directory policies, then you can have multiple group policy objects that can apply to a given user or computer and it's pretty important to understand the scope of management because if some of those policies conflict with one another you need to understand which one will take precedence and which one wins. Okay, we're about to address an exam objective that says troubleshoot policy settings. Now, first of all, like, like many of the other troubleshooting objectives that we'll address for the 70-622 exam, most of troubleshooting is to configure something properly in the first place, and if you are having troubles with it, to go back and look to see where something has been improperly configured. That's a big part of what troubleshooting is. So for policies, I'm going to show you how to properly configure policy, and that'll get you 95% of the way there when it comes to troubleshooting policy. Also, I'm going to have a real, uh, real dilemma here because I am going to teach you what you need to know for the 70-622 exam and the exam objectives. Uh, however, it's going to be difficult for me personally because uh, I teach a five-day course on nothing but group policy. So in order to be able to take everything that I, quite frankly, just know about group policy and condense it down, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but I'll make sure that you have everything that you need to know. Also, I've decided to address group policy here at this point in our video series because uh, a couple of times in the past I've mentioned policies or I've shown you a configured policy and I've said, well, I'm teaching ahead of myself a little bit, but and then I'll go ahead and show you what it is that I'm showing you. Well, group policy is pretty well integrated into a great deal of any Windows environment right now, especially in the corporation. So I think I better just go ahead and address group policy here. That way we've got it out of the way. And a lot of the other exam objectives as well have a lot to do with one or more configured group policies. So that's why now is the time to start teaching that. Now, first of all, let's go ahead and talk about policies. We have a couple of different kinds of policies. And the first of those is something called a local policy. Now, I specify local policy, and this really differentiates it from something else called a domain-based policy, or most frequently, we just kind of generically refer to those as group policy objects, or GPOs. All right, So these are different, and the interface looks the same between the two of these. Uh, it looks very, very much the same. However, the scope for where they apply is going to be different. Okay. A local policy only applies to this one computer. So if I have a local policy configured for the computer you're looking at right now, that's the only computer it applies to. If I have 100 other computers in my environment, I cannot take a policy that I've configured here and copy it to some other computer somehow. Instead, I would have to just write down what the settings are and manually change all of the policy settings on a destination computer and just make sure that I don't forget anything. So local policies only work on individual local computers. A group policy object, however, is much more of a corporate solution because I configure those in the domain. In fact, they exist on the domain controller in Active Directory and in the sysvol, uh, which is a file share that appears on all domain controllers. Now, the group policy object, I can configure a setting. Maybe it's something like, oh, turn off the control panel so that nobody can access it. That's one setting I could configure. And if I have done that on a domain basis, that would then apply to all computers throughout my entire domain. It takes the administrator about 15 seconds to configure, and, and pretty soon nobody will have access to the control panel now. So you can see the difference there. Group policy object, much, much more broad in scope, although you can narrow that down as necessary. A local policy only works on this one computer. Now there's also a differentiation based upon what your client operating system is. So if you're working with Windows 2000 or XP, one, your one local policy is kind of a one-size-fits-all thing. It applies to everybody, including administrators. And as an, as an unintended consequence sometimes, we have inadvertently locked out administrators out of certain key things, and we didn't really want to do that. Uh, so Microsoft has loosened that up with Windows Vista such that we now have the ability to have something called multiple local group policy objects, uh, MLGPOs. And this means then that I could still have a local policy much like I did in these client operating systems that was a one-size-fits-all. But then if I realize I need to make a differentiation 
between my non-administrators, and I want to lock them out, and then my administrators, I have the capability of being able to do that. So I might lock people down who are non-admins and remove control panel. But then I might have another level in my group policy object where I loosen that up and allow it for administrators. So, you know, Joe user logs on who's just an average non-admin, he doesn't get control panel. Susan logs on, she's an administrator, she gets control panel. And then we can also be even more specific with local user accounts. M notice that I said local user accounts, not domain-based user accounts. Uh, but I could uh, identify a specific user there and say I want that one user to be able to have privileged use of something. All right, so let's go ahead and make a visual reference here, and we'll take a look at some policies. Now, I've made a remote desktop connection to Vista Client 01, and the only reason why I'm using another computer instead of my main teaching one is because sometimes I might have to log off and log back on and, and show you the effects, and it gets to be quite cumbersome to do that all the time while simultaneously trying to record. So the way I, way I configure local policy is this. I'll click on Start. And I can go to also a command prompt or a run line, either one. Uh, and I can just then type gpedit.msc. This opens up a Microsoft Management Console item. And this is what I would do if I wanted to open up a local policy. Now, this is the group policy object editor. And if you're working with an Active Directory group policy object or the local computer policy, much of this will look exactly the same. Uh, the interface is pretty much all the same here, so not, not too hard that way. Now, let me just illustrate how this stuff works. I might have mentioned earlier that policies will configure virtually every aspect of what the user and or the computer can and cannot do and what it's permitted to uh, have exposed. So if I take a look at this, for example, under administrative templates, we'll see that if I wanted to go to, let's see, Windows components, let's just try to find a good example. Well, it's this one down here at the bottom. Windows sidebar. Let's take a look at that. First of all, do I have a sidebar? Yes. That's this thing over here that shows me that it's a, uh, a very chilly day here in Phoenix. At least it's, it's chilly for us. <laughs> 65 degrees is pretty cold for us uh, here in the middle of the winter. Uh, and then there's a calculator and some other things. So these are gadgets that are all part of the Windows sidebar that I can configure. And I can, of course, add additional items there if I want to. But with the Group Policy Object Editor, maybe I want to turn that off. Maybe it's a kiosk machine that I want to use at a trade show, and I don't want passers-by to be able to put their own gadgets on there or to some other, somehow otherwise configure those items. And if that's the case, then I'll use this policy to be able to do that. Now, let me also point out that we're on the extended view. There's also a standard view. Uh, the extended view allows you to see a description of each policy. So I'll click Turn Off Windows Sidebar, and it tells you pretty much what you would think it would tell you right over here. It says that it will turn it off if you enable that policy setting. There's also the standard view, which I'm primarily going to use for our purposes, only because then we'll be able to see the policies, whereas the, in the extended view, sometimes they get cut off on the end. Uh, so I'm going to go to standard, and I'll just manually explain some of these if, if necessary to you. So here I could turn off the Windows sidebar. Now, there's also over 3,000 policy settings. So you're not expected to memorize these or, or know each and every one of them, but you should know the broad categories of them and how to be able to find at least the general area that you're looking for in group policy. Now, if I wanted to turn off Windows sidebar, how would I do that, and what are all of these different settings? Well, first of all, I double-clicked on it to open this up. And if you're looking at the standard view, but you want an explanation of what the policy does, you can also click Explain, and this is the exact same text that we saw in the extended view. Now, what are these settings? By default, everything is configured at Not Configured. This simply means that we're going to allow the default behavior to continue. By default, we can use the Windows sidebar. So, so leaving it at Not Configured simply means that I can continue to use the sidebar because that's already the default behavior. The other thing I could choose is enabled, and that's what I'm about to use here in just a moment. Enabled would mean that it would no longer allow me to use the Windows sidebar. Okay? This basically turns whatever the policy is into a true statement. So if I select enabled, that makes this true. Now conversely, if I choose disabled, that makes this statement false. Okay, so uh, in this case, it's not really necessary because since I already have the Windows sidebar, it's a little bit of overkill to choose disabled because, you know, that would already be something that I have the capability of is using the Windows sidebar.
Now, also, you do have to think through this a couple of times sometimes and read it twice, some, maybe, <laughs> because these are also double negatives, or at least conceptually speaking. Turning off, disabling, you know, that kind of has a double negative in the thinking of it. So sometimes you have to kind of think it through a little bit to see whether it's going to really turn it off or not. And if you get confused, again, go to the Explain button, and it says here that if you disable or do not configure this setting, Windows Sidebar will be turned on. Okay, easy enough. Okay. Now, I'm going to choose Enabled. That will make this a true statement, turning off the Windows sidebar. Also notice here, by the way, that I did not click on File and you know Save As or something like that. In fact, you see there is no option like that. Instead, all you do is you just simply click OK when you're done configuring the policy, and that's it. It's immediately available for use. That does not mean that it immediately turns on. In fact, look over here. I still have the Windows sidebar. So is something wrong? No. You see, there's a refresh policy that takes place between 90 and 120 minutes. And sometime in that duration, this client will uh, look to its own local policy to see if there are any new changes it needs to apply. And the sidebar policy would be one of those. And it also looks to a domain controller to see if there's any new policies up on the domain for my group policy objects. Now, in this case, I can update the policy manually as well if I want to go ahead and uh, kind of trigger it uh, myself. And I can do that by going to a command prompt, or I could just type it in the start search over here. But I'm going to use a command prompt because uh, I want to show it to you. Uh, and if I do it from a start run or a search or something like that, it immediately closes the window and you can't read all the messages. So I'm just going to do a GP update. And that's the command that we do to manually trigger a policy refresh. And then we see here that the user policy update is completed and the computer policy update has completed. Uh, and normally you can just do this from you know this line right down here if you want to. Uh, it's just that it will cause all this to immediately go away and you won't be able to see it. So for teaching purposes, I wanted to just demonstrate that it was up there for you. Now, you look at this and you say, well, James, that policy didn't seem to do a good job of refreshing <laughs> because we still have this Windows sidebar. Some things you have to actually log off and log back on for, okay? So we're going to go ahead and do that. Let me go ahead and close this up, and then I'm going to click on uh, just log this off. And when I log back in, we're going to see that we do not have the Windows sidebar anymore. All right, so I've logged back on here, and notice, again, we don't have the Windows sidebar here. Uh, once again, some of the policies you will have to log off to uh, uh, affect the policy or to be able to see the effects of the policy. Uh, and those would be policies that affect the user configuration, or if it's a computer side policy, sometimes you'll have to restart the computer. Now, if I click on Start and then go to Windows Sidebar, I'll just do it the normal way here by going to Accessories, and then Windows Sidebar, then if I try to click it, look what happens. I'll get an error message here, or just an informational message, saying that it's managed by your system administrator. Well, that doesn't really say that it's restricted by a local policy, but that's just kind of a generic message. And I have that because of the local policy that you saw me configure earlier. Now then here I quickly went back to the Group Policy Object Editor, where I revisited the location of this policy. Notice that it was the Windows Sidebar item here. Okay, and that appears underneath the computer configuration. Notice that if on the user side of things, notice there's also a user configuration, there's the same exact setting under there. So if I go down to Administrative Templates, Windows Components, and then Windows Sidebar, look, we have the exact same setting. Turn off Windows Sidebar. So if I enable it on one side and I disable it on the other, what happens? Well, let's make these settings conflict. So on the computer side of things, remember it was set and enabled. But here, I'm under the user side of things, the user configuration. So I'll choose disabled, and it's in direct conflict with the other one. In that case, since these two no longer agree, which one wins? Um, well, I'll just tell you which one wins. The computer side settings, if there's, a, if there's a duplicate setting between computer configuration and user configuration, computer configuration always wins. So even as uh, administrator or whatever, any user here, uh, by disabling this, it will have no effect on me at this time. Because the computer configuration enabled this setting, and I cannot override it from the user side. Now then to avoid confusion, I'm going to set everything back to the way it was and make it not configured again. And I'll do the same thing up here on the computer side for the Windows sidebar. And I'll just choose again, not configured. Now. When I go back to not configured, it'll now go back to whatever the default behavior is for the sidebar, which means that it will allow the sidebar once I refresh policy and log off and log on again. 
All right, now let's go ahead and take a look at the multiple level group policy objects, okay? In order to work with MLGPOs, you don't just type gpedit like I did earlier. For this one, you have to start with uh, an empty MMC console. So I'll just type a MMC right here, Microsoft Management Console. You have to get user account control for this. I'll click continue. And then I'll add in the item. So I'll click on file and add remove snap in. Once I've done that, I want to go to the group policy. Let me expand this out. A group policy object editor. We do not want to use group policy management for what I'm about to show you here. That's for later on. We'll get to that. But for my purposes, multiple level group policy objects, uh, then we'll go to uh, group policy object editor. I'll click on add. And here's where it says group policy object local computer. If I just click finish right now and then OK back here in the background, that'll be the same exact tool that we looked at just a moment ago that, that I used to edit policy. Uh, so there's really not much difference there. But if I click on browse with this one, then I can be different. I can say browse for a group policy object based upon my users. And now I can say for non-administrators, I want to do one kind of policy. But for administrators, I want to do another kind of a policy. And then for my individual users, I want to do yet another kind of a policy. So let's take an example of this. I want to take my non-administrators, and I'm going to configure a policy that will completely remove control panel. Notice that right now, without having configured a policy yet, I can click control panel and I have you know pretty much the whole thing. I can uh, go to any of these different items and click on them. Okay, So uh, I've got that. But for non-administrators, let's say I want to take that away now. So I'll click OK and then I'll say uh, finish. And then once I'm done with that, I'll then have over here local computer non-administrators policy. The next thing I could do is I could click continue to add, and I can click on add here again, and once again, browse, and then go back over here to, again, my users, and say, but my administrators, we need a different kind of policy for them, so I'll click OK there, and then I'll click on finish. And then I'll co con continue to do this for my other items here as well. So I'll go back to my users again. Maybe I have, uh, you know, Haley has another item that I want to configure. Oh, Haley, so I'll click OK here and finish. And now I've got three different ones, non-administrators, administrators, and Haley. Now, once you'll, one thing you'll notice as soon as I click OK here is that if I expand one of those out to edit the policy, let's just go to our non-administrators, for example, notice that there is no computer configuration for any of these. Okay, The only time you get computer configuration is only in the, that one local group policy item, the, the local policy item. Okay, All these other ones where you can make a differentiation based on whether they're non-administrators, administrators, or a specific user, you only get user configuration. So here I'm going to go to my administrative templates. By the way, uh, under user configuration and administrative templates, all of these are actually registry settings that take place. Uh, and these are all going to make a registry punch once this policy is enacted in one way or the other. And so now I want to go to my control panel. And maybe I want to disable the ability to see the control panel at all. So what I can do is go to this item, prohibit access to control panel. And I'll enable that and click OK. And uh, then I'll cl close. For now, I'm going to go ahead and save this. And, I, and for this, I can save the console. That doesn't save the policy setting, but I can save the policy console here if I want to return to this later on. So I'll just call this you know, admin console for the time being. And I'll call it local policies, okay? Uh, or better make that make more intuitive, I'll just call it MLGPO, okay? Because that's what we referenced it earlier. So then I'll go ahead and save this and close it up. Now, I'm going to log on as a different user. So let me just log off. And we'll log on as a different user and see whether or not they can access the control panel. So now Haley logs on and clicks on the start orb and notice there's no control panel here or in computer where it might otherwise have appeared over on the left. doesn't appear there either. If she clicks on start and search, normally you can access a lot of things from here. So she wants to go to control panel. Uh, she just types, starts typing it in down here. Notice that it appears here, but she'll still get an error message anyway. And notice, by the way, I wish they'd change the wording of this. It says, please contact your system administrator. I wish they'd change the wording of that to, this feature doesn't work because you did not buy the administrator a birthday present. <laughs> but, you know, they don't 
They don't ask me when they build these error messages. Also notice that she will not be able to access control panel functions that she would normally be able to either. So if she wants to right click on the desktop and change the display properties or something, she can do something, but she goes to personalize. She can't do that because that's part of control panel. So she's not able to do it there either. So now I've returned here as a, my logon with the trainer account, that's an administrator account, where I created this console originally and saved it a little while ago. Now, let's say that Haley says, you know what, uh, I take this computer to trade shows and kiosks and sometimes I need to configure the company screensaver or the wallpaper, or something like that. So I need to be able to make a change there. You know, generic users, yeah, maybe they shouldn't be able to access control panel here. Uh, like we've got, notice that it's that that policy is enabled which prohibits access okay but this one user needs to so what we could do here is to make an exception for that user so we'd go down here to control panel down here and then it would hate it would say uh, prohibit access to control panel double click and I would disable it and okay now because this is a more specific policy than this one which is just non administrators then this policy down here for Haley should override the previous one that we saw okay so what the net effect of this should be that when I log back on now as Haley she should be able to gain access once again to the control panel so now here I've logged on as Haley and once again we had the policy enabled uh, that took away the control panel and that was for all non-administrator users. Now I've logged on as Haley, who has a specific user account where we've granted access to her specific account. Now she will have the control panel, and we can see that it now appears here. If she wants to change the screensaver or the wallpaper or something like that, she can also do that now here as well. So uh, that's how we're able to work with multiple level group policy objects. Now, a critical thing to understand in troubleshooting group policy is the scope of management, or we usually just abbreviate this SOM. Remember what happens with a computer out of the box. It has default behavior. Can you access the sidebar? Yes. Can you access control panel? Yes. You can override that behavior, however, with a policy configured on any one of these levels within your hierarchy. First of all, remember there's the local policy, um, and you could do that just one policy for the local group policy, or you could do a multiple level group policy object. That's what we did in our example, where we enabled a policy. Remember that? And that policy was to prohibit access to control panel. So at that point, uh, the non-administrators is how we configured that for the multiple part of that. Uh, the non-administrators were not able to access control panel. This included Haley because she was not an administrator. We made an exception for her uh, so that her user account would be able to access control panel even though she wasn't an administrator. Uh, now within the local policy and within this multiple level group policy object, let me draw out to the side here, there is a hierarchy you should be aware of. The first one is just going to be just local by itself. okay, And the second one is going to be uh, non-administrators and I'll just abbreviate here non ad min okay so if we have a conflict between the local policy and the non administrator in a, in a lo multiple local group policy then the non administrator policy would win then we have another higher level of a hierarchy here which would be the admins okay they would take precedence over anything configured in either one of these other two lower levels okay and then the finally we would have a user level policy like we did for Haley Okay, user, I guess I better make an R there. Now this would be the highest level of priority within a multiple level group policy object. And we saw how that worked, because remember, we configured a policy on the non-administrators that enabled the policy that said prohibit access to control panel. So Haley, as a user, was not able to access the control panel. However, later on, I went to the user for Haley in the multiple level GPO, and I disabled that same policy so I disabled it for that one user okay and in that case she was able to access control panel so the further down this list you go the higher the level of precedence even though she was a non administrator and would have had prohibit access prohibited access to control panel because she had another policy further on down that was more specific to her and further down the level of uh, the order of inheritance then we disabled that same policy this allowed her to access control panel then policies take a further step down here 
These are all Active Directory objects, and these were, I'll just put out here AD for Active Directory, and that's where most administrators will configure their policies, somewhere within here. In fact, mostly it's going to be in the domain or organizational units. Sometimes we do policies on sites, but not very often, because they're pretty far-reaching, and they're usually too comprehensive in their scope. So here's how the order of inheritance would go. We'd have our default behavior. We would have our local policies or our multiple local group policy objects, which would follow this hierarchy. Okay, remember right there. And then we would have additional policies, perhaps in Active Directory. So a site policy that conflicts with a policy over here on a, mul on a uh, local level would take precedence. If a policy on this level disagrees with a policy on this level, this one wins. And then it goes a step further. If a policy is configured on the domain and it disagrees with anything further up above it here, then the domain will win. Okay, the domain takes precedence or takes priority. Then it goes a step further down. An organizational unit. This is going to be normally be a collection of users or computers or both, but we usually try to separate them in a smart active directory infrastructure design. So we'll have an OU full of computers or an OU full of users, and any policies uh, attached to or linked to an organizational unit will take precedence over anything further up the chain here. And then if we have a sub OU, uh, it would also take precedence over its parent OU, and again, anything else further up the chain. Let's go ahead and take a look at how we would configure policies within an Active Directory infrastructure. All right, so how do we edit policies for the domain? What you need to do is to edit, edit the Group Policy Management Console, or the GPMC. You could do that from your Windows Server 2003 domain if you want to, but it's not advisable because there are about 800 policies available for Windows Vista that Windows Server 2003 does not know how to read uh, and doesn't have the capability of directly editing. So I don't recommend that you do that from within Windows Server 2003. Windows Server 2008 does have all of the settings, so if you want to do it from there, you're certainly welcome to. Uh, for my purposes, I'm going to go to my domain controller here, or rather to my uh, Windows Vista computer here, excuse me, and I'll do a gpmc.msc and press Enter. And then with administrative uh, consent, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Now what this does by default is it makes a connection to a domain controller because remember, since uh, group policy objects or active directory objects that also have files in the sysvol, it has to be able to connect to a domain controller to be able to read this. All right, now what I can do here then is to take a look at my Active Directory hierarchy. Here are my Phoenix users, for example. And remember, for my Phoenix users, if I, if I go to take a look, then I have uh, Phoenix user 01, Phoenix user 02, and so forth. We don't see that here because I don't have Active Directory users and computers open, but if I go back to my domain controller and act access Active Directory users and computers up here at the top, then remember, we do have our user accounts here. Now, a critical thing to understand is that if I create a policy and I want it to apply to, let's say, Phoenix User 01, then Phoenix User 01 must be in the scope of management. That means they must be somewhere in the hierarchy that we saw earlier in our whiteboard. I can either configure a lo local policy for that user wherever they log on, or a site, domain, or an organizational unit policy for that user or all of those users within that OU. Normally, we'll, administrators will avoid sites, will do some in the domain, but probably most of your policies will be in the organizational units. So returning to my domain controller here, if I want a policy to affect my Phoenix users right here, I could link it a number of different places. I could create a policy and link it to the site, but that would apply to all domains within my site. Okay, that's a little bit out of, getting a little bit out of our scope, but that's too comprehensive. I could also create a policy and link it to the domain right here, but then it would apply to both Phoenix com users and Tucson users. Well, that's also possibly too comprehensive. I might not want it to apply to these Tucson users. So if I wanted to be more specific, I would create a policy, and I would link it to the Phoenix users organizational unit. And then the Tucson users would never even read it because the policy would not be linked to their OU. It would only be linked to the Phoenix users OU. 
So then again, I could create a policy here from within Windows Server 2003, but since it doesn't uh, recognize all the policies that are available for Windows Vista, I'm probably better off to go here to my Group Policy Management Console from a Vista machine. Now most administrators will probably be sitting at a Vista machine. They don't normally sit right at the domain controller, but they can sit at a Vista machine and use the MMC consoles to make a connection to their actual servers, and this is how they'll do most of their administration. So here in NuggetLab.com, I want a policy to apply to my Phoenix users, but not my Tucson users. Okay, so what I would do here then is I would I could do it a couple of different ways. I could right click here to choose create a GPO in this domain and link it here. You see, we actually create a group policy object, and then we link it. Uh, here's several existing group policy objects that have already been configured uh, within this organization. If I wanted this particular policy, whatever it is, to apply to you know, my Phoenix computers, then I could drag it up here, and then it says, do you want to link it to this OU? And I could say, OK, and then it would take effect. I'll just cancel it for the time being. Uh, but you can see how that works is we can take an existing policy that we create and drag it to some other location. Or if we just want to kind of shortcut it, if I know I want it to go to the Phoenix users immediately and I don't want to create one and then drag and drop it, I'll right click here, choose create a GPO in this domain and link it here. And let's just call this one remove, uh, how about remove screen saver uh, from control panel, okay? We don't want people to have access to the screensaver in control panel. Okay, so I'll just click OK here. Then the policy doesn't actually have anything in it. All the settings are set at not configured, so I need to right click on this to choose edit. Once I choose edit, then I can go into where I know that policy setting is in control panel and in display, and then down here it says hide the screensaver tab and I'll choose Enabled. Now it still says Screensaver Tab. In reality, in Windows Vista, there's not a, a tab like that, but we'll click OK. There's a link in Control Panel, which then takes you to it if you want to split hairs, but that's OK. We're going to hide the Screensaver tab for any of those Phoenix users now, right? OK, so I'm going to go to this Vista Client 01 item, and I'm going to close up whatever I've got open here, and I'm logged on as the trainer account. Just for good measure, I'm going to do a GP update. By the way, if you want to, you can also do a GP update space forward slash force. And I think I'll actually do this from a command prompt so you can see it take effect again. GP update force. And this will uh, force uh, the policy settings to take place even if there have been no updates. Because every time a policy is changed, there's an internal number that gets incremented. And GP update looks to see if that number has been incremented. If there's been no change in that numbering, then it will not apply the policy in a fresh way. But if you want to just kind of, you know, override everything and cause it to force application of the policy, even if there has not been a change in the policy number, then you can do that by using the force option. Now I'm going to go ahead and log off as this administrative account. And when we log back on again, we will log back on as one of the Phoenix users, and that user should not be able to see the screen saver. And here I am logging on as Phoenix user 01, which you can see right here on the start menu identifies who I am. I want to right click on the desktop to choose personalize and access the screen saver. Uh, but I can't. Why? Because I turned on that policy. Let's take a look at it again. I turned on this policy to remove screen saver. And if I right click and choose edit again, remember that that was under administrative templates, control panel, display, and then for the screen saver tab, we decided to hide that tab so it was no longer visible. In the interface on a Vista computer, that means there will be no screen saver item available here. Now let's review again where this policy is linked. It's linked to Phoenix users. But I also have a, T a Tucson user here as well. Notice that they don't have any policies linked here to the Tucson users. So what will happen if I log on as a Tucson user and that's what I've done right here. In fact, it's not done logging on quite yet, but you can see here, Tucson user 01. What happens with them in their screensaver settings? If I right click here and choose personalize, notice that they do have a screensaver setting that they can make use of from within the control panel here. That's because they were not within the scope of management for this policy. They don't have this policy on the Tucson users. 
Now, what if we decided, hey, you know what? That was a mistake. We really do need to have the Tucson users have that same policy. Well, I could take this Remove Screensaver tab, drag it up here to Tucson users. Do you want to link it there? OK. Now we have that Remove Screensaver item linked to the Tucson users. Now I'll go back to my Vista Client 01, and I'm just going to quickly do a GP update and press enter here. Uh, now you don't have to be an administrator or anyone of special privilege to be able to run GP update. Even generic users do have that capability. So once I've done that, we'll go ahead and uh, see what happens here when this uh, closes up. In fact, I think I can probably do it now. I'll right click and choose personalized, logged on as Phoenix user zero, uh, excuse me, Tucson user zero one again, remember. But now that I've enabled that policy by linking it to that user's organizational unit, Look, voila, they no longer have a screensaver tab, and that happened just lickety-split. As soon as I refreshed the policy, I didn't have to log off and log back on again. It just took place immediately now. Now let's also take a look at how the disabled item works. Here what I'm going to do is I'm going to re remove this link to the Tucson users for removing the screensaver. So I'm going to delete this. I'm going to delete the link itself, not the GPO. The GPO will still exist here under the group policy object settings. There it is, remove screensaver, okay? So I'm clicking OK here, and notice that it removed the link. The policy still exists. Same thing with uh, Phoenix users. There is the remove screensaver link to the policy, uh, and I'm going to disable, I'm going to delete that. I can also choose to deselect this checkbox, uh, but that's not my objective right now. I just want to remove the link entirely. And now we don't have that remove screensaver item anywhere anymore. It is here in the group policy objects, but since it's not linked to anything, it's just kind of a lame duck policy. Uh, it's just not actually doing anything. It's just waiting to do something. As soon as I link it to something, it will take effect. Now, since I repetitively attached the same policy and linked it to both Phoenix users and Tucson users earlier, both in two separate actions, I might just as well have taken this whole thing and dragged it up to the entire domain. Do you want to link it to the domain? OK. Now it would apply to all users throughout my entire domain. Let's say, however, that my uh, Tucson users down here, that this is where my administrators are, and I don't want them to be able to have the restriction for, the def for this uh, remove screensaver item. So what I could do here is I could uh, create another GPO in this domain and link it here. And I'll just say, allow screen saver. Okay. And now what I'll do here is I'll just set up a conflicting policy under Administrative Templates, Control Panel, again in Display. And then I'll choose this item where it says Hide Screensaver Tab. Double click there. And I will disable hiding the screensaver. Now it's in direct conflict with the other policy that linked to the domain that was chosen for Enabled. Now, since this one is further down the hierarchy, and it's a more specific policy, remember it kind of flows down, uh, then well, this one will take precedence. So if I'm a Tucson user, I will have my screensaver. Anybody else throughout the entire domain, including these Phoenix users, will not have this, the screensaver tab. Let's go ahead and test that out just briefly here. So here I'm going to log on as Vista Client 01. Who am I logged on as? Tucson user 01. Right now, the policy hasn't refreshed. So in the control panel, uh, we will see that. Well, actually, let me do it this way. Let me right click on the desktop and choose Personalize. We see that we don't have a screensaver item. If I refresh the policy, however, GP update, then as soon as this is done refreshing, we'll see that I get the screensaver item back. And let's test that out here. I'll right click here, choose personalize, and now you see that I did indeed get the screensaver item back. And again, I'm logged on as Tucson user 01. So quick review on that because there's a lot of going back and forth here. Uh, what happened? Let's go back to our policy to identify that. Okay, here we had a, on the domain, we linked remove screensaver. This applied to Phoenix users and Tucson users and anybody else that I would have had down through here. The Tucson users, we realized that was not a good policy for us to have because we're administrators and hey, we love our screensavers, right? So we created a conflicting policy that disabled hide the screensaver item. So now since that one's in direct conflict in our order of inheritance, remember this, then the scope of management, the more specific policy further on down the hierarchy is the one that wins. So that's how that works. Now at the risk of complicating things, let's take this a step further. Here we saw that this policy conflicted 
with this policy, but since this policy was further down the scope of management, it took precedence and it won. But most policies are cumulative. Let me take a look at that one. Let me illustrate that one with the Phoenix users. In the Phoenix users, what policies did we have? We had the remove screensaver item that took place, didn't we? And we saw that the Phoenix users had the screensaver tab taken away. But they don't only get that policy. They also get any other policies that are in the site, domain, or organizational unit. I don't have any site policies, but I do have a couple of other domain policies. Remember where in a previous video we added the administrators to the profile uh, for the uh, roaming profiles for users, well, that one applies, plus anything that's in the default domain policy, which is their password policy, where it sets, you know, whether or not they have comp complex passwords, how long it is, when it expires, and the like. So those two things apply cumulatively, plus the remove screensaver tab applies to these Phoenix users, and then it also adds the redirected folders, because remember we had that in a previous video as well, where we redirected their documents folder to a network share location. So my Phoenix users actually have the cumulative effect of one, two, three, four different policies that all add up together, and they get the effect of all of those. My Tucson users really have all of these policies as well, except that this one is overridden down here by a conflicting policy, and since it's further down the hierarchy, that one wins. In this video, we talked about policy basics, where we started off by talking about local policy. Remember, that one's going to contain the computer configuration that applies to everybody and the user configuration that also initially applies to everybody, unless you want to override some of those settings with a multiple level group policy object. And remember, with that one, we can take our, uh, our policy a step further by applying settings to non admins, and I'll just abbreviate non-A, <laughs> or you can then take another step further and apply policies to only administrators, or you can take it another step further and apply policies to users. Okay, So there's a whole order of inheritance that takes place with that. And then we also had a scope of management that applied to an active directory infrastructure, where it goes to from a site to a domain to organizational units, and then to sub-organizational units. Well, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.